support those who are passionate about wildlife, ecology and conservation. We stock a variety of books and equipment to suit the needs of marine conservation professionals and our innovation and research team are here to help develop custom products for any project. We are happy to provide advice and to support you before, during and after your purchase. Visit nhbs.com today to find out more. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Assemble Plus conference for this new this session with a series of talks. Um, and uh, before we start, I just wanted to say that uh, uh, later on at the end of the talks, we'll have a draw uh, to 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 uh, offer three vouchers offered by NHBS. You just saw the advert, um, uh, so that you can buy stuff, you know, books and whatever from HBS. So, without further ado, I would like to thank all the speakers that accepted to be part of this conference. Uh, and we start with Daniel van Dederen. Uh, from Technical University of Denmark, and he's going to speak about the impacts of bottom troll uh, fishing and oxygen depletion on banding communities. Please, Daniel. Thank you. Yes. So, without further ado, I would like to thank all the speakers that accepted to be part of this conference. Uh, I have a delay somewhere. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, so indeed, I will talk about today about uh, uh, impacts of bottom trough fishing and oxygen depletion on Bantu communities uh, and show you the, the work we did um, uh, via Assemble Plus on a, a research cruise in, in the Southern Baltic Sea. And uh, together with Jan Hiddink, uh, I applied um, to the Assemble pro uh, well, program and we had a lot of co-workers that you can all see here. And just to start, uh, let me see. Just to start with uh, a bit of uh, a few words of thanks. Uh, we had many, many helpers in, in, in the field crews, and that was very, uh, that was very nice and also very, uh, very helpful for, for us to do the work. Um, and they came from uh, many different places uh, around Europe. So thank you very much for that. Uh, it made it a very pleasant uh, research experience. At the same time, I also like to thank the, the crew of RV Oceanograph, the, the research vessel we uh, we used via Assemble Plus, which is from the University of Gdansk. And last but not least, I very much like to thank uh, Rafael Lasota, who helped us both in the preparation as well as on on the, the on the on the vessel to do a lot of the work um, and made uh, the connection between Assemble Plus and us uh, a very. Uh, no, well, it worked very well, and the connection with Gdansk University. So, as I said before, as mentioned before, and this talk will be about bottom trawling as well as uh, on uh, the, the effect of oxygen on the Benthic communities. And many of you might know that that bottom trawling is one of the the bigger human disturbances on um, uh, many of the European shelves and many also of the shelves in other areas in the world. And as you can see here, this is a figure from 2015, where the red uh, er, the red patches show areas that are being fished up to 10 times per year. Uh, and whereas the blue patches are relatively uh, low fished in intensity. So, but uh, quite a large area <clears throat> in Europe is frequently being fished. At the same time, if you look then at areas where there's low oxygen concentration, and this is a map where I show all field work which have shown uh, uh, oxygen conditions that are that are um, uh, well, at least uh, known to affect the benthic organisms. And this is all oxygen concentrations near the seabed. Uh, then you can see that many of these areas overlap, both many of the shelf areas are affected by trawling as well as by, by oxygen. 
And this, of course, brings you to the question, so what is then the, the interactive effect of, of these uh, two pressures? This is important now, as there is already much overlap between these two uh, disturbances. But it's also predicted in the future that due to uh, the climate warming, there's more stratification of the water column. There's also more expectation of more marine heat waves. And these are all known to increase the amount of uh, hypoxia. And, uh, and, and, and this will mean that more and more shelf areas are uh, uh, potentially being affected by these two uh, pressures in combination. So thinking about the interaction, you can see in the literature that there are some suggestions of synergistic effects between hypoxia and bottom trolling this term, so that the combined effect is larger than the sum of the individual uh, pressure. This has been suggested by, um, by echinoderms, uh, which elevate their, their disc when, when uh, they're, uh, well, when, when oxygen is low, they might do some tipping behavior and this elevates their discs. And, and that results in uh, uh, that they're just above the, the seafloor where the oxygen conditions are a little bit better. But it also makes them more vulnerable to, to bottom trolls that uh, yeah, go over this, this seafloor surface. And a suggestion was in, in this paper already in 1990, that there were a higher amount of uh, bycatch and especially echinoderms like brittle stars and also sea stars um, due to uh, this elevation of disc behavior in areas with low oxygen conditions. Um, another behavioral effect that, that, that scientists observe is that uh, in fauna may move to the sediment surface and this is just to avoid the low oxygen concentration or even an anoxic conditions in, in the deeper water column. And all these behavioral responses to oxygen will increase the risk of an animal to be exposed to trawling. And this will lead to a um, synergistic impact of these, you could say. On the other side of the, the coin, there, there could be antagonistic effects. And these antagonistic effects could happen um, when, for example, hypoxia lead to higher mortality than trawling and or migration of mobile fauna. And in, in, in that case, uh, you, you could expect in an area that is affected by hypoxia, that trawling may result in the glacial impact on the bentos. Uh, and so these, these two interactive effects have, have quite a different meaning also in, in terms of the management of bottom trawl fisheries. So should we protect areas that, are, um, that have low oxygen concentrations and that are therefore um, even more sensitive to the impact of bottom trolls? Or should we protect areas that are, uh, have uh, more, more, more higher oxygen concentrations? Because when the oxygen is low, the, the seabed is not that much any longer impacted by trolling. Um, and we found a few studies doing this, but we were specifically interested in the, in the Baltic Sea. Um, out of uh, work we did previously for the Baltic Sea, where we try to understand these, these interactive effects. Um, and what you can see here is, is two maps. The left map shows the, the, the minimum seasonal oxygen concentrations in, in milliliters uh, oxygen per liter. And this shows, uh, this is of course model predictions. Um, and everything that is very yellow, you could say that is anoxic seafloors, so there, there, is no, there are no benthic animals around. But er, everything that is kind of light blue, that are areas where the oxygen conditions are known to affect benthic organisms, uh, not necessarily uh, that they kill all organisms. At the same time, when you then compare this with the fishing footprint in the Baltic Sea of, 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 um, of otter trolls, uh, you, can, you can estimate that approximately two-thirds of the Baltic Sea bottom troll fishing footprint occurs in areas with low oxygen concentrations. And that means that if you want to understand the impact of, of bottom trolling in the Baltic Sea, you need to know whether you're severely overestimating or severely underestimating uh, these, these interactions, these interactive effects. And, well, this was all based on some kind of literature study to, 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 to assess 
uh, the, the interaction between these effects and also based on an, uh, a modeling approach. But then we thought, well, maybe we can start to explore this in, in the field. And that's what we did. And, and, and that's uh, where we used the Assemble Plus program. So with the Assemble Plus program, we applied for um, a research cruise in the, the Southern Baltic Sea uh, using the, the research vessel from the, ocean, uh, the University of Kadansk, the oceanograph. Uh, to do in 11 days uh, field work uh, in this region and, and to look at the interactive effect between these two uh, between these two pressures. And I would say the nice thing of Assemble Plus is that we, we applied uh, well, um, in, in early, early spring and already six months later, we were uh, on the boat and, and, and doing the analysis. And that was very, well, it's a very quick process uh, uh, to get uh, something done, I would say. Um, so as I said, yeah, so we, we carried out the sampling in September 2018 in the Southern Baltic Sea, uh, where there are both gradients of bottom trolling disturbance as well as gradients of uh, oxygen concentrations. And we both used uh, dredge to get uh, an estimate of the, the, the upper epifauna benthic organisms uh, or the infauna that lives close to the seabed surface. We did a box score to take an, uh, a measurement of uh, what, what, it, what is there in, in the seabed. And uh, we also used a uh, Niskin button to, to map out uh, what the oxygen concentration is as it was at that location at that moment in time, and to have an estimate of salinity, temperature, and, uh, and of course, depth. So, you can see here the, the results of our, uh, well, you could say cross experiment where we both try to have a, an oxygen gradient as well as a fishing intensity gradient. So in the end, we sampled 19 different locations, uh, each with a number of times using the dredge and a number of times using the box score. And you can see that what is interesting is that in the end, we want to do an interactive model to see, we want to do make a model where we include both these, these variables to see what is the, interact, the interaction between the two. And uh, well, to a large extent, we got most of the parameter range uh, uh, that, is, that is there between these different uh, pressures. At the same time, what we could also look at, and I will, sh I will show you both, is that we, we have also data with at relatively low fishing intensity, where you can purely look at changes in the oxygen as well as we have data at relatively high oxygen levels where we can look at fishing intensity as some kind of subsets to confirm the main uh, model modeling effect where we use all data together. Um, yeah, so what, what do you find in, in the Baltic Sea there? It's not that species rich. And I think with this figure, I have uh, most of the the charismatic species uh, that are there. So it's a really an, uh, a system uh, uh, yeah, with, with a few species. Uh, and, and, and I show you here a few uh, of the bivalves and also Saduria that, that we found uh, in, in many of, the, many of the samples. Since we were looking into gradients of oxygen, what you also sometimes, well, what accidentally happens in, in, in some cases in this, in this, uh, in this study, is that we went too, too much towards low oxygen conditions. Um, and, and, and then we hit some areas uh, where the, where the seafloor was uh, anoxic. Uh, and, and then you get you know, some, some box score like this without any species and which is very smelly. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, well, it was easy to, to see and to see uh, the number of uh, animals because they were zero. Uh, but of course, we were trying to avoid as much as possible to get too many of these locations. And what was nice is that we also took some subcores of the box score really to look at the, the, the vertical distribution of the fauna in these cores and to see if oxygen concentration also affects the vertical distribution of fauna um, uh, and, and whether that depends on uh, yeah, the amount of oxygen. And here you can see uh, a core without any fauna. Uh, and, and this is actually a, a detritus layer, which suggests that there is quite a lot of uh, detritus falling, was falling uh, this year towards the seafloor. Um, yeah. 
So looking at the results, um, so in the end, what we try to understand is so what are the interactions between bottom trawling and, and oxygen on benthic biomass, benthic community biomass, benthic community abundance. And here I show you um, on the left side, uh, a plot of box core biomass and here dredge biomass um, over a gradient of oxygen concentrations. And we fitted this with an uh, a linear regression model, which had some threshold values uh, because in, in, at very low conditions, we had many uh, uh, zero oxygen uh, observations, uh, zero, uh, zero biomass observations. So we had to make some kind of threshold uh, to, fit, to fit the linear regression. What you can see is that, well, below 40% uh, near bad oxygen saturation, uh, there's not that much biomass around. There's one station with a little bit of biomass, but most of the stations don't have any animals. And this is both in terms of biomass as well as in terms of abundance. Uh, whereas if you go higher than this 40, there is a general increase in, in uh, benthic biomass and abundance with uh, a large spread. So all the colors you can see here are, uh, are standing for the, the left, the amount of fishing intensity with gray having very low intensity and, and red, very high intensity. And what we actually saw is that uh, in statistical model, we found no effect of bottom trawl disturbance on, on benthic biomass. And we also found no interacting effects, um, <clears throat> suggesting that everything we observe was driven by uh, these oxygen uh, changes in the oxygen gradient. And this was both the case for benthic biomass as well as for benthic abundance. Um, then we try to look into it in, 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 in a different way to see maybe we, by looking only at biomass, we are uh, oversimplifying uh, the potential response. <clears throat> so we looked in, um, at these two subsets, as I explained uh, earlier. So we looked at all stations with low fishing intensity on the left side and all stations with relatively high oxygen percentages on the right side. And then we try to see what is the proportion of animals in the benthic community with a certain longevity. So what you can see here, so with oxygen at relatively high oxygen concentrations, the proportion of animals with a longevity between three and 10 years <clears throat> is very high. And there seems to be some kind of decline in proportion of animals that is long living because at this percentage of oxygen, you see many, uh, well, many more uh, short living uh, uh, organisms in terms of, uh, of biomass, a of fraction of biomass. Whereas at very low conditions, we have, of course, no fauna. Um, this might indicate that due to the changes in oxygen, there is a change in, uh, in the trade composition of these, these benthic communities. Looking at fishing intensity, uh, there's not that much changes in the trade composition, which again suggests that fishing intensity is not uh, not very uh, big uh, predictor variable or explanatory variable in 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 this in these communities. Even though we have fishing intensities ranging up to seven times a year, which means that the seabed is um, uh, well trolled uh, seven times uh, a year, uh, and so that these organisms are being swept seven times a year, yeah, on average. So then we also looked into in the number of large individuals, just to see if that's maybe an, a better indicator of, uh, of impact. And again, we found a very clear correlation between with oxygen and the number of large individuals, which was all individuals larger than 0 0.5 gram in, in the box score. Whereas we did not find any significance effect uh, in, in the model or, or with uh, fishing intensity. So, in conclusion, then, we could say that um, there's a very low likelihood in this area uh, of synergistic impacts of bottom trawling and hypoxia. <coughs> Excuse me. And this is um, this this allows you some, uh, some to think from a management perspective, these results then suggest that we should perhaps prioritize benthic protection from fishing in regions that are not in a state of oxygen stress, because protection of of uh, bent protection from fishing in regions which are in a state of oxygen stress, uh, it seems that 
fishing in these areas does, doesn't have a, a very large additional impact uh, to the effects that are already occurring uh, from oxygen. Um, we're still trying to understand a little bit further why we don't find any effects of fishing um, and, and, and whether the, the, the communities in these areas are so resilient because they are short living uh, that that could be expected. Um, but at the moment, we at least see that, uh, uh, that, that there is a very low likelihood of synergistic impacts between the two. Um, before I, 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 I'm done, I just want to highlight that um, uh, there's also some, th this, this work we did uh, doesn't end here, uh, and there's some future work uh, in the same area on, on trawling and hypoxia impact on, on nutrient cycles. And this is being led by uh, both Maria Skiberas and Marco Bartoli. And uh, this is also going through via Assemble Plus. So it's very nice to see that um, we both did this, uh, this work uh, as well as uh, that uh, Assemble Plus allowed us to, <coughs> to have an, uh, a follow-up study in the same area to see what is happening with the nutrients and, and interaction with the benthic organisms and trawling and hypoxia. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, any questions? Um, I'm not sure if I, if I missed. Um, so if you compare oxygenated and less oxygenated areas, are there very deep, big differences in catches? Um, I know you presented that graph showing fishing intensity and so on, but if you think in terms of catching uh, catch per unit effort, you know, uh, is it different? So it's oxygen actually uh, having an impact in the in the in the catch. Um, well, at least it, it depends a bit on the fishery. In in these areas, um, the fishery has been uh, partly caught, <coughs> which is just above uh, the seabed, and which might experience less impact of of the, the low levels of oxygen. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, for flounder, which is also being fished there, I would expect there is an impact in the catch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, any questions? No, so we, I think we have to wait a little bit for the right time for the next speaker. Thank you very much, uh, Danielle. Um, yeah, you're welcome. So we'll, um, we'll have to wait a bit so that people that wanted to want to listen can, can do. First-class scientific research relies on effective, convenient access to tools, facilities and data. Assemble Plus is a European Union-funded research and innovation program with a consortium of over 20 partners that integrates key marine research facilities across Europe and beyond, offering access to top-tier research infrastructure through a competitive application procedure, evaluated on the basis of a feasibility assessment and research excellence. Whether from academia, industry or policy, through its easy and straightforward application process, Assemble Plus provides scientists with on-site or remote access to biological resources, varied ecosystems, experimental facilities, technology platforms, e-infrastructure and expertise, and provides lodging and catering support over the course of their placement. Assemble Plus also performs its own networking and research activities, ranging from interacting with new users and businesses to cryobanking marine organisms to providing diving services for researchers. Over the course of the project, as well as providing access, Assemble Plus aims to strengthen transnational and multidisciplinary networks, create public-private partnerships, enable new technologies and services, upskill researchers, and improve the long-term sustainability of Europe's marine biological stations. So, if you are a researcher in need of access to marine infrastructure, such as laboratories, equipment, or any other provision, Assemble Plus welcomes proposals for access on a rolling basis from the 29th of August 2018 to the 30th of October 2020. For more information about the project and call for access, please visit www.assembleplus.eu.
The marine environment is a rich and largely unexplored reservoir of biodiversity with vast potential for food, health and biotechnology. The European Marine Biological Resource Centre, EMBRC, is a research infrastructure which aims to unlock the knowledge and innovation potential of our oceans. It enables researchers and companies to access marine organisms, expertise and experimental facilities to study them. Headquartered in Paris, EMBRC brings together 45 sites in nine member countries. We provide access to specialist facilities and services that enable researchers from academia and industry to study marine life and develop innovative solutions to address societal challenges like climate change and health and food sustainability. We support both fundamental and applied research, particularly for areas like biodiscovery, biotechnology, aquaculture, biodiversity and climate change research. EMBRC-supported research has already led to novel, high-impact research in human health, product and medicine development, and aquaculture, and it's helping us to fully grasp the crucial role of ocean life. EMBRC has benefited hundreds of researchers across Europe and beyond, delivering robust and efficient services and expertise to help users obtain the best possible results. So EMBRC is continuing to develop its services. We're working to start recording biodiversity at many of our sites using molecular techniques to put in place so-called genomics observatories. This will allow us to have a much better understanding of how our oceans function and their current health. In addition, we're increasing our bioprospecting capabilities to better support the development of new products and solutions from the sea. EMBRC is a single access point to remote and on-site services in Europe, supporting marine research and innovation across borders. At NHBS, our purpose is to support those who are passionate about wildlife, ecology and conservation. We stock a variety of books and equipment to suit the needs of marine conservation professionals and our innovation and research team are here to help develop custom products for any project. We are happy to provide advice and to support you before, during and after your purchase. Visit nhbs.com today to find out more. So uh, before that, before the prostaglandins, we go for, um, for uh, brown algae. So it's maternal determination of apical basal polarity in the brown algae dictyota. And it's Kenny Bogart from the Ghent University. Please go ahead, sorry about the confusion. Uh, no problem, no problem. Um, I hope you can see my screen. And I will try yes, to... fine. Uh, Just click to... Yeah. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Then you can hear me. Okay, great. Uh, so I'm, I'm Kenny Bohart. I'm, I'm working in the lab of Olivier de Klerk and of the Ghent University. And I mostly study uh, Dictyota and mostly concentrate on the spores and the zygotes in order to use this as a model to study cell polarization and asymmetrical uh, cell division in a plant context. A bit like the Fucus research of uh, last decades, um, but then on a different algae. And there are some similarities and some differences here. Uh, here I will concentrate on maternal determination of the apical basal polarity here. Uh, and we'll look at the autofluorescence in this context. Uh, I applied for an ensemble grant, uh, the Maple Phi grant, and uh, I went to Plymouth and made use of the excellent uh, two photo microscope there in order to get better insights into maternal uh, polarization of the zygote. Uh, so, developmental biology poses the uh, 
important question of how a single cell can develop into a complex organism composed of, of, of multiple uh, cell types. We all are complex organisms and we all are derived from this single zygote, this single stem cell at the beginning of our lives. Now, one process that does that is uh, asymmetrical cell division. You start with one cell and you get two cells with a different cell type. Asymmetrical cell division is often, um, um, it starts with cell polarization. Uh, so a, a side of the cell that will uh, get a different cell function and cell fate. And then uh, cell division will, uh, will, uh, will differentially uh, separate the determinants, the cell fate determinants to the two cells. Here we see a uh, schematic depiction of the asymmetrical cell division of fucus, uh, a, a, an important model system and from the brown algae. And we uh, here we can see it's a round cell and the axis formation is first a labial axis and there is a axis formed and directly we have a uh, direction and both sense of the vector that is determined by uh, yeah by the light vector. So they they um, they form the rhizoid in the at the dark sides of the cell. Um, and B, the, this axis is permanently fixed. In the beginning, it's still level. It can change depending on the light direction. This can change then. Uh, at some point, it's fixed, and the cell will germinate. Will produce a rhizoid. And if the cell then divides, we get a um, a rhizoidal cell, and we get a tau cell. I prefer to talk about a polarization vector rather than a polarization axis, because it alludes to the informational different compounds that a vector has, and a vector is, has a direction, it has a sense. Um, maybe I'll put my laser on. But, uh, it has a sense and also a magnitude. So the direction is like you go into a street and you say, I'm in that street. Uh, so you know which direction you're walking, but you don't know whether you're going uh, to, the, to the city or away from the city. That's the sense of the, of, the, of, of the vector. Also, there's a magnitude, which is the distance you would walk, uh, but yeah, that's less important. The sense and the direction are important for this talk. Um, so most of, a lot of research has been done on fucus. Uh, so the, the process is well studied. Um, but this model has fallen out of favor to some extent because you cannot culture fucus, so you have to go to the beach always and collect your cells. It's very difficult to culture, at least it's possible. But, uh, and if you have a mutant, you would lose it. So we were studying Dictyota, and here it's, uh, it has been cultured for decades. It's easy to culture. Um, so here's Dictyota. It has a sporophyte, a male uh, gametophyte, and a female gametophyte, and they all look like each other, um, very similar, except for the reprodu reproductive structures. The sporophytes have tetrasporangia, the male gametophytes have uh, groups of anteridia organized in sori, and the female gametophytes uh, are characterized by groups of ohonia, sori of ohonia, and these are the ones that I studied in the sample grant uh, in, in my trip to, to Plymouth. Um, to study the maternal polarization there. Um, if we look at the embryos, we immediately see uh, that, uh, that these uh, cells are, or these embryos are fusiform, which is a bit different from uh, fucus, where they stay rather round. Um, so there must be some elongation there occurring, but elongation is, is a very normal thing in embryos. Also, Arabidopsis elongates after, uh, after fertilization. Other cycles also do elongate according to the axis uh, via growth. Um, so that's not, not very special. However, uh, in this case, we get a, a very fast elongation of, uh, I'm not sure again, a very fast elongation of uh, the cell after uh, fertilization. So we have a round cell, soccer ball shaped cell, uh, egg cell. If it gets fertilized during uh, the following 90 seconds, uh, we get a shape change, not growth, growth but shape change uh, that changes the shape from a soccer ball into a rugby ball uh, or also a prolate spheroid in uh, scientific terms. So uh, this black line we see here, that's the, that's the average of a population of cells. And this 
blue lines that has the length average, uh, the length, me length measurement of a single cell. And we see that just in 90 seconds they elongate uh, and then this, this, they, they, they stay at this permanent length. Um, this elongation, uh, that's nice, a uh, cell can do that, but it's also very important for the uh, polarization process. And uh, because it's according to this elongation uh, direction that the polarization axis also, or the polarization vector will be determined. So this, the direction of the elongation axis is actually the direction of the polarization vector. Uh, either here or here, or here, or here, the uh, rhizoid will be formed. It will never be formed in the equatorial zone uh, over here. It's always at one of the two tips of the rugby ball. So it's important for uh, cell polarization. Um, yeah, here you see uh, activation in fucus. So there's no elongation. And also uh, there is a gradual activation of the cell wall production uh, as assessed by cocofluor staining. Uh, in fucus, it takes about five minutes uh, until the whole cell is covered with cell wall. So it's a, a slow process migrating through, throughout the, the, the cell. In Dictyota, however, we get after uh, already after 50 sec seconds of the onset of elongation, as assessed on these lines, uh, we see a faint signal already appearing. Um, and this, this, yeah, so that we have a homogeneous cell wall production. It does not rely on an additional signal uh, propagating throughout the cell. So to, to make a long story short with pharmacology, we come up with the, with the following model that uh, that uh, fertilization uh, will trigger, similar to fucus, a membrane depolarization. Also, high potassium seawater can trigger that, and then you get a population of, of, of these rugby balls uh, just by uh, fertilization or high potassium seawater. And this will trigger a likely a uh, calcium uh, inflow in the cytoplasm and triggers uh, effectin and myosin to act, to, to, to provide the force the motive force to change the shape of the cell. At the same time, a cell wall is produced because uh, this same uh, fertilization also uh, sets in motion the secretion of cell wall and adhesive material. And this cell wall will, 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 will keep the shape uh, that is newly formed, is, is formed uh, thanks to this uh, force uh, provided by the actin and uh, the myosin action. So, okay, um, but the relevant question for this talk is how do they get their, their uh, how do they decide which direction they will elongate? It's such a small, just a fast process that it must be already present in the, in the cell, in the egg cells, uh, rather probably maternally uh, polarized. So to determine that, uh, we sectioned it with transmission electron microscopy, that's a bit, um, yeah, complicated way of, of doing it while well, we could have done it with the confocal microscope but that has some problems um, so if, if we section it with the transmission electron microscope and uh, use uh, spatial software to map the chloroplasts and make a kernel density map then we see there is uh, yeah there's clustering around the nucleus but that's not so strange but what is strange is that there is some clustering in groups and these, this clustering in groups will also determine a direction. Uh, it's significantly uh, clustered along a, uh, a axis. And this is uh, likely the, or this is the, the, the elongation axis, as can be seen here with confocal uh, images, which are only able to uh, visualize the cortical, um, the cortical chloroplasts, because the chloroplasts are so dense that uh, the central nuclear chloroplasts cannot be visualized, as, as can you see that here. It's just very faint in this region. However, in the, the cortical region, it's clear that here there is a very few signal, yes, very few signal. And this axis, uh, which is also sometimes visual on the bright field uh, of this excellent microscope, uh, we see that they will elongate according to the axis predetermined here. Um, so we have difficulty at, at visualizing the chloroplast distribution because of the density. Uh, and there is a solution to that. There is a two-photon, multi-photon uh, confocal microscopy 
has a much higher penetration depth. So this would be able to, um, to visualize the, the more nuclear uh, chloroplast distribution. Uh, and uh, that would be ideal to use for the ohonia. Uh, so therefore, I applied for an assembly ground and uh, went to Plymouth to look, uh, to, to look at my ohonia uh, with the two photo microscope of uh, Colin Brownlee. Uh, who is also at the same time a fucus expert, so a perfect environment to study this uh, this question. Um, but again, transmission electron microscopy um, suggesting how the aggregation of uh, chloroplast must be, but it's, it's not. It's in two groups, but there's also some holes in the groups which make interpretation a bit difficult. How you have sectioned and so why is this important? Uh, it, it is important because it means that the, um, the polarization scenario that is being used in Dictyota is very, very different from that of Arabidopsis or Fucus. In both Fucus and Arabidopsis, both phase one and phase two, that is determination of the sense and the determination of the direction of the polarization vector are de determined at once. In Arabidopsis, it's completely maternal in Fucus, it's completely environmental during the cell cycle. While in Dictyota, we have a early determination of, uh, of the direction of the polarization vector and a late determination of the sense of the polarization vector. So this, when they are fertilized and developing, there are two possible rhizoid poles, either here or here, or for the case in, in Fucus, there are an infinite number of rhizoid poles. The following polarization process that is a bit similar to that of Fucus will choose one of those two poles. And also here, light will be, uh, will, be uh, in, um, the, uh, will, will determine which pole will develop the rhizoid pole. Um, so, if we look at the ohonia, so this is all on, on X and, 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 and zygotes, if the, the axis must be there. And this is also suggested by uh, just technovid sectioning, where it's easier to orient your material and so on. Um, and uh, there we see the chloroplast distribution getting lower around the equatorial zone. It would be better to have this, to have the views on, on a focal microscope. But for that, we needed to photon uh, cofocal microscope. So uh, I went to Plymouth. Um, no, I went to Plymouth to uh, visualize that. Here we see uh, ogenesis of the female thallus. And uh, if we, for example, would visualize with a thunder imaging system, which is rather new and nice, but uh, it, it just doesn't get through or, or, um, or uh, yeah, we can see here there's a small image. Um, not sure if it's going to load. Yeah, it's loading. If you, well, it's very nice because it's, it's moving and, uh, uh, but it, it just only gets the cortical uh, chloroplasts and no signal at all from, from the central uh, region, uh, which is here, that's completely black. So with the two photon microscope, we do manage to get a signal uh, from the cortical, uh, the, no, the nuclear uh, region, more than the cortical region. Uh, but um, so this, this this microscope does the trick, does do um, does do what we want. But it's it's uh, it's not what I dreamt. Uh, I hope to have a more sharper image of the chloroplasts and be able to make a three dimensional reconstruction. It's not possible to visualize the entire uh, ohonia because also here uh, the, the the signal is so dense that even the two photon uh, has difficulty to crack this, dif this difficult uh, not, uh, nut. Uh, but we get a signal, and so it, it's difficult to, to visualize uh, ohonia that are on top of the thallus, um, because by the, by the time you're in the middle, the signal starts to fade and it's get, it's get too difficult, and the penetration depth is not enough to get a sharp image. However, uh, by focusing on those ohonia that happen to be uh, at the borders of a thallus. So a thallus is a, has a flat leaf and there's some borders. And sometimes, normally there's no ohonia on these, on these borders, but sometimes they do have. If by looking at those, uh, we get a, a, a visual according to uh, yeah, um, perpendicular on the, the, the plane and on in the direction of the axis where we would expect it. 
So uh, that was the solution. Uh, so that stacks and, and three-dimensional reconstruction will not be possible, I think, uh, because we cannot delineate all the individual chloroplasts, but uh, we can have a view on these. And if you zoom in and with, uh, with um, fake coloring or with, uh, with, with putting some thresholds uh, at, at particular densities, we do see that in the nuclear region, uh, sorry, in the equatorial region of the ovonium, there are, uh, there is a lower density of signal. So this probably corresponds to the equatorial region of the ovonia and the axis uh, of the ovonium, so it has long axis, is probably also the elongation direction uh, along which the X will elongate uh, after fertilization. So it, to some extent it does the trick, but uh, Z-stacks, that is not a paradigm option. Also the, the lutephotum has problems with this. Um, so um, what is also nice to do is that we can have, uh, can, can visualize the release of the um, ohonia being released. So um, we see here that this, these uh, cells getting squeezed out of the um, ohonia. Uh, the cell walls are stained with coccofluor and the red signal is just the autofluorescence. Again, a faint faint uh, signal or, or, or a blurry signal of the chloroplasts uh, that can be seen, but, uh, but at least we can get through uh, to the entire cell. Uh, this is getting a bit slow, I think. Um, um, maybe I should switch to the mouse. Yeah. So we see that the uh, cells getting released here. Um, and they leave like this, this yeah, trumpet-like structure, the whole um, after the release. So other images were taken and so uh, we can, uh, but again, it, it's difficult to follow the entire process of the, the chloroplast distribution. Uh, and some last movie I wanted to show, again, it's, 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 very optic, it's very pleasant to view, but uh, scientifically, it doesn't tell me much. Um, so I want to thank Olivier de Klerk, uh, that's, that's uh, my supervisor, uh, Tom Beekman, my long-standing collaborator, and uh, also Colin Brownlee and Assemble to be able to work at the uh, two-photo microscope and, and, and uh, to give me access to this. Thank you. Uh, if there are any questions, you can, you can ask them. Thank you, Kenny. I don't know if there's any questions in the in the audience. I uh, well, I, of course, I don't know much about this. A little bit more about fish, uh, which is quite different. But uh, so I've, I've got two small things. One is, uh, would you would you be able to follow better with the light sheet microscope because it may give you a, a thicker mm. um, view. I think the, the penetration that would not uh, would, would not make it uh, would not change. I think it wouldn't change. So I think two photon is really the, the thing to do, and uh, uh, the penetration that is there. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, I'll, and uh, for this, you know, um, uh, elongation, do you, can you uh, let's say are there any any. Uh, biochemical markers, any markers that you can follow to, to, to look at the distribution or uh, and see you know, where the term determinants are going to end up, this kind of thing. So markers like, you mean the, act the cytoskeleton or something? You could yeah, stain you the see, basically you see how the different components are, are moving in the, in the... Yeah, stainings for, for, for these, uh, we, we cannot uh, transform. Uh, brown algae to, to that extent that that's a very new technology, but uh, um, yeah, stainings of, of cytoskeletal would indeed be a logical choice to do mm -hmm. uh, and to see their the maternal, uh, yeah, maternal yeah. polarization to better detail because that's probably what, 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 uh, what is causing this elongation. Um, yeah. How does the actin cytoskeletal looks like? Yeah, so that, that, that's the biggest question. Uh, that, that, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, 
we, we might suspect some apical ring, or but I rather uh, expect a diffuse network of actin that will not necessarily give a good view. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much. I don't see any more questions in mm -hmm. the chat. Okay. okay, great. Yeah. So, again, we have to make a bit of time um, until 13.30, and, uh, and, and then, then it's Valeria's turn. So, we'll see in a second. Which relies on effective, convenient access to tools, facilities, and data. Assemble Plus is a European Union funded research and innovation program with a consortium of over 20 partners that integrates key marine research facilities across Europe and beyond, offering access to top tier research infrastructure through a competitive application procedure, evaluated on the basis of a feasibility assessment and research excellence. Whether from academia, industry or policy, through its easy and straightforward application process, Assemble Plus provides scientists with on-site or remote access to biological resources, varied ecosystems, experimental facilities, technology platforms, e-infrastructure and expertise, and provides lodging and catering support over the course of their placement. Assemble Plus also performs its own networking and research activities, ranging from interacting with new users and businesses, to cryobanking marine organisms, to providing diving services for researchers. Over the course of the project, as well as providing access, Assemble Plus aims to strengthen transnational and multidisciplinary networks, create public-private partnerships, enable new technologies and services, upskill researchers, and improve the long-term sustainability of Europe's marine biological stations. So, if you are a researcher in need of access to marine infrastructure, such as laboratories, equipment, or any other provision, Assemble Plus welcomes proposals for access on a rolling basis from the 29th of August 2018 to the 30th of October 2020. For more information about the project and call for access, please visit www.assembleplus.eu. Hello, thank you for waiting. So now, finally, the next talk is by Valeria Didatto and uh, on the metabolism of prostaglandins, uh, which are normally associated with animals. Uh, and in this case, it's in marine microalgae. So Valeria, please go ahead this time. We should be, should be fine, I hope. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, because I it have a mic. Oh, I see. I thought you were. I thought you were at sea, but it is. It's not. It's just the background. <laughs> okay. Okay. Can you see the? Yeah. Fine. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So I am a researcher at Facce uh, Geologica of Naples. Um, okay, um, Adelina already uh, introduced the title of my talk. Um, I have been funded by uh, both Assemble Class and Embric uh, um, different times. Indeed, I participated to the two calls, uh, two Embric calls um, using the CCMR and uh, HZI and HCMR uh, <coughs> facilities. And uh, I participated already to two assembled class calls, plus the last one that I will do in the next few months, and uh, in which I used the service offered by ESIMAT in Digo, in Spain, and CCMAR uh, um, in Portugal. And um, uh, the, the fact that I have been uh, uh, funded. Um, more than once uh, helped me to advance and uh, uh, let's say almost uh, finish the project that I proposed. However, the results are still uh, under uh, um, examination analysis. So I will uh, uh, tell you what uh, the, the, the studies behind my uh, funding records. 
So, uh, first of all, a brief introduction about diatoms uh, for those of you that don't know much about. So, diatoms are a huge group of uh, <clears throat> microalgae composing uh, the phytoplankton. Um, the characteristic is that, as you can see in this image, uh, they can assume very different uh, uh, forms based on the, um, uh, on the symmetry that they can be. Uh, they assume that can be radial or uh, bilateral, and also the color is very different. So, and um, the most interesting uh, striking characteristic is that they lie, uh, they are surrounded by a silical wall. So it's like they are um, living in a glass uh, box. Uh, they are able to, um, and most important is also that they are able to um, synthesize, release. Um, some exciting and important uh, molecules that um, can have an um, uh, important application in the pharmaceutical fields, uh, acting as anti-tumoral or anti-inflammatory or also antibacterial um, um, products. Uh, also, among the, the same, inside the species, there are a lot of species that many of them are still under investigation and uh, inside the species um, a species um, there can be a lot of differences among strains uh, and uh, another interesting characteristic is that they are able to um, produce polyunsaturated aldehydes so uh, why we decide to study the prostaglandins in diatoms let's see the arachidonic acid metabolism so um, after a um, stimulus on uh, outside the cell, the phospholipase, the cell, the cytoplasmic phospholipase A2, um, liberates the um, uh, fatty acid from the membrane. Uh, usually in animals, this is the arachidonic acids, but can be also others. And uh, on this released fatty acid acts the, the liposigenase, releasing a series of molecules that are called um, um, polyunsaturated aldehydes that have been discovered in uh, Skeletonema marinoi, that is one of uh, the uh, diatom species. And uh, the concentration of these molecules can change, it has been discovered that can change um, inside, among species and uh, clones inside the species. And um, it has also uh, been demonstrated that they can have a negative impact on the um, predator population feeding on them. In fact, as you can see in this image, um, the, the impact on, the, on this, on the predators is not on the adult uh, feeding on them itself, but on its um, um, uh, progeny. Uh, and uh, the damage, uh, as you can see, uh, this is a normal napri, but the napri, if the mother fed on the uh, diatoms, uh, uh, can, um, have a very disturbed uh, uh, development, and uh, this is the damage that uh, they can have uh, is more uh, severe as um, higher hard days uh, during which the, um, the mother fed on the diatoms. As you can see here, this is after five days, and here is after nine days. And then it has been established that this effect was due to uh, the activation of an apoptotic cascade as you can see these other um, in the lower um, photography. But uh, on the, this free fatty acid can act also in other uh, enzyme that is the cyclosigenase COX that, is, uh, that produce these molecules that are prostaglandin that is very, very important in all the um, representants of the animal kingdoms, um, but also in some, um, they, are, they have been identified also in some plants. However, the most study um, the, um, in, in animals is concentrated, in particular in humans, there are a lot of, uh, of studies characterizing the cyclophygenes and all the pathway downstream of producing these molecules. And in fact, um, the prostaglandins, as you can see, we can have a lot of different uh, uh, molecules with uh, just changing some uh, configuration in the skeleton. And they are um, a physiological active lipid acting as uh, uh, having a normal like effect. 
in fact, after uh, the, the action, the liberation of the fatty acid from the, the membrane, uh, the cyclooxygenase act on the um, uh, free fatty acids, and uh, um, thanks to a series of another other different synthases, you can have uh, uh, there is uh, the synthesis of different kind of molecules, um, and the names of the molecules uh, derived from the synthase that have been um, uh, operated on the um, precursor liberated from the fox. So uh, you can have the um, prostaglandin E synthase, uh, prostaglandin D synthase, and so on. And depending from the, each of these molecules have its own receptor, and depending from the receptor of which they act, um, they can have a different action. And um, the action can be uh, um, inside the cells, can be in the cells very close to the, the, print, the, the one that have released the prostaglandins, or very far from these cells. So uh, they have both an autocrine and paracrine effect. And as you can see here, they can uh, have really a lot of uh, very important effects on, uh, in different metabolisms. They can be involved in, very, in a lot of very important metabolisms for human, like uh, um, uh, <clears throat> pain, um, inflammation, uh, uh, fever generation, uh, reproduction on the reproduction system, and so on. Um, there are three kinds of um, prostaglandin series that depends from the precursor. So if coming, uh, uh, starting from the arachidonic acid, we have prostaglandin uh, series two. Um, the other two um, precursors are the, the homogamma linoseic acid that gives the, the series one, and the diacoinsapentenoic acid that gives the series three. Um, the important thing is that in diatoms are able to produce also these two, but in reality, the majority the, um, of the free fatty acids is represented from, by the eicosapentenoic um, acid. So, um, uh, as I told you before, the, um, this uh, Cox uh, uh, side of the, um, this, uh, the Lox side, of the pathway has been very well investigated already. So we decided to understand uh, if the, the Cox pathway that has uh, never been investigated in this kind of organism was also present. So using this Skeletonema marinoi uh, diatoms, we, uh, uh, for which we have two strains producing different amount of haldeides, um, we did a transcriptome sequencing and we decided to analyze this transcriptome for um, the um, prostaglandin pathway. These uh, two strains I named uh, FE7 and FE60. The FE7 is the one um, producing high amount of uh, oxylipins, while the FE60 uh, is one producing very low amount. So here is the map of uh, arachidonic acid uh, metabolism with the, the green box representing the uh, enzyme find noted in the transcriptome. So as you can see in the FE7, this is the uh, prostaglandin pathway, this is the cyclooxygenase, and this is the prostaglandin E synthase and the prostaglandin D. Um, and um, while in the prostaglandin, in the FE60 uh, strain, we didn't find annotated this uh, Cox. Um, um, sorry. Okay, this, uh, the Cox one was not uh, annotated, but we have annotated the, the, um, uh, the prostaglandin E synthase and D synthase. So probably the, um, the level of expression of the Cox in the FE60 was too under um, the. Um, was too low to be uh, to be, uh, to be seen from the uh, in the sequencing process. So we decided to um, confirm this data by um, measuring the expression of the um, of the pathway in this uh, during the growth of this um, culture, cell in culture. 
So here is just a resume starting from the three, uh, three fatty acid precursors, so particularly the echosapentenoic uh, uh, acid. We found annotated in the FEC then uh, the uh, COX enzyme that is present two times because uh, it acts on uh, the first uh, steps is the, the synthesis of uh, a precursor called PGG2, and then it acts again on this precursor to give another precursor, the PTH2, and on this one acts the other series of uh, synthase synthesis. Uh, and in this case, we found annotated the PTE synthase that gives this kind of uh, prostaglandin and the PG synthase. Um, so these two were annotated on, in both strains. So we decided to uh, confirm the expression during the, the growth of, uh, of the strains. So in particular, the growth of diatoms has um, three phases. You, we can distinguish three phases an exponential phase. Uh, and, um, that is at the beginning where the cells start to divide very um, happily until they uh, reach a status where they stop to divide. And this is called the saturary phase. And then there is a, later on a senescent phase where they start also to die. So usually uh, diatoms are able to produce these uh, secondary metabolites in these two in the last part of the growth curve, where they feel the stress of the overpopulation and also of the uh, loss of the nutrients that have been uh, used during the, the growth. So we collected cells in these three phases at the beginning, uh, so at the border, at the edge of the um, one phase to the, to the another. And we did a um, QPCR experiment. So we found that uh, here you can see gene expression normalized on the exponential phase. So the cyclosigenes was downregulated, particularly in the um, senescent phase in the strain FE7, uh, while, the, while the other um, enzyme was not. And in FE60, um, the cyclosigenes was um, really downregulated already also in the stationary phase, not only in the senescent, but also the other two enzymes, the E synthase and the PGD, were uh, downregulated, strongly downregulated. This is a transporter that we found annotated uh, in the transcriptomes, um, so it's not a synthase, uh, but just uh, is a channel that uh, exports the prostaglandin from inside to outside the cell. That is also in FE6 downregulated. So when we normalize the FE6 with the FE7, we found a very downregulation of all the pathway in respect to the FE7. So also in this case, with this kind of molecules, the two strain um, show a difference in the um, pathway um, expression. And we also measured the um, prostaglandin inside the cells. And uh, we were able to find prostaglandin representative of all the series. As you can see, we have the PGAE1, uh, uh, the two, uh, also the three. So uh, meaning that uh, 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 the diatoms are able to, to start for, from all the three um, uh, fatty acid precursor, even if the EPA is the major um, representative. And there was a difference in the amount, not only along the, uh, the, the, phase, the three phase that we uh, sampled, but also among the, the two strains again, and particularly this was uh, uh, confirmed also done from the uh, measure of the PGE3, that is the one that we expected more because of the EPA uh, amount in diatoms, that you can see was uh, present um, in both strain in all the three phases, but uh, in all the three phases was in FE6, it was downregulated in respect to um, FE7. Uh, then we, uh, um, Contemporary to this study, we start also to study another diatom, Salacecilla rotula, and uh, we uh, analyze the transcriptome also. Now we are also studying the genome of this species. And uh, again, we, we found annotated the um, prostaglandin pathway. 
but with some uh, differences. We found annotated the, the COX enzymes, the PGA synthase, but not the PGT. Uh, we found the FC, uh, PGF synthase. So um, in this, this, this uh, comparative study so, uh, show a difference in the, between species in this case. Also in this case, uh, we did uh, a study, a gene expression study, and allowed the, the growth curve of the of these species. But this time we didn't sample the cells only in three uh, points, but we sampled the cells every day for 10 days uh, uh, along the, the growth of the culture. And uh, what you can see here, uh, the results was that the PGH synthase, that is the COX, has a peak of expression at day five of the growth curve, um, while the other two, the PGE synthase and that synthase, had a, a peak uh, one day before, so at day four, as you can see here and here. And this is interesting because uh, the day five and four. Uh, usually, the border, the age of the, the passage from the exponential to the stationary phase, when the cells are more stressed because of the overpopulation, because of the um, uh, reducing the concentration of the nutrients that have been used, and also because they um, um, they normally uh, live uh, in symbiosis with them. Um, bacteria population that uh, uh, started to have uh, to increase also during the stationary phase of the uh, diatom culture. So, so this can also mean that uh, in, it is, uh, it is uh, like a, a sort of inflammatory status. Uh, also in this case, we measured the, the um, molecule produced. Uh, but not inside the cell. This time we uh, measured them outside the cells. And what we could see was that we had this uh, reduced panel of molecules. Uh, the ones more interesting was the PGE2 that um, along the, the growth uh, goes to zero. Uh, whilst the PGEM was to very up. Um, and the interesting thing is that the um, PG2 uh, is very unstable molecule and is um, soon transformed in PGM. EM. So this can um, reflect the normal uh, physiology in human, uh, or, that, or uh, at least in animals in general. And uh, um, we also find that these um, uh, derivatives of the principal uh, um, prostaglandin, the, the D, the J, and the F. And um, we can see the, also uh, the, P, the interesting one is the, this PGJ2, because uh, uh, this one can act um, in animals as an inhibitor of PG2 synthase. So justifying also the down, um, uh, regul uh, down uh, the decreasing concentration of the PG2 molecules during uh, um, the growth tool. So uh, that's why we decided to um, understand uh, uh, the role of the prostaglandin in this kind of organisms so, uh, and uh, understand if they can have a similar um, function as uh, uh, in animals, like uh, chemical mediators or, um, related to the um, uh, handling of the stress. So I used the, the assembly plant and then the program to um, expose the cell to different kinds of uh, stresses uh, and different uh, range of stress, like uh, um, very low and very high temperature, uh, very high and very low light and high level of nutrients like uh, CO2. Um, and uh, also to same, and I sample these, uh, um, the, 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 this growth uh, at different uh, time during the day. 
and I collect the cells to uh, make gene expression analysis and uh, chemical analysis both inside and outside the cells. So um, this experiment is still ongoing. Uh, the, the analysis of the experiment is still ongoing. The gene expression analysis is ongoing here at Satsuna uh, at um, A first step uh, of the, the chemical analysis um, begin began in uh, HZE, but we had a lot of trouble uh, in um, purifying uh, um, the molecules on the columns because of the high con salt concentration in the seawater. So we are now um, looking at uh, um, setting up uh, new purifying uh, protocols. So this one is very, uh, uh, it's at the very beginning. beginning. And uh, on the other side, we decided to, um, I am using the assembled class access to the system R to clone the um, cyclosigenesis, and marino cyclosigenesis, and study uh, its kinetic uh, of activity um, under different parameters of pH, light, uh, and the temperature. Um, and this is, this will be, um, the cloning is done, but we are still uh, trying to refine better the protein and to, to do this kinetic uh, analysis. Um, and these results will be important not only for an ecological point of view, but also to have um, to translate these results in a biotechnological application, because nowadays prostaglandins are used in um, hospital pharmaceutics, but they cost really a lot because of the uh, number of, uh, an elevated number of steps that they require to be synthesized. So just to recapitulate it, we, these prostaglandins are um, present in these simple organisms. Um, they show differences among the stage and species with the different uh, gene expression of the enzymes in the pathway. Um, uh, with uh, different uh, kind uh, of molecules synthesizing along the, the growth and uh, with the different kind of concentration. Um, they pick of uh, uh, they pick of the concentration um, and the gene expression is at the boundary of uh, with uh, between the um, uh, exponential and the stationary phase that can be. Um, uh, indicate, that indicate that uh, they can be involved in the handling of the stress. And um, uh, they are not only synthesized inside of the cells, but also released, um, indicating that uh, they can really function as uh, a chemical uh, um, signaling also to maybe to, uh, to cope, to manage the relation with the outside. Uh, and the all the stimulus inside the, the other organisms in the marine environment. Uh, in fact, uh, what is ongoing outside the assembled class uh, uh, project is the, the understanding of the, their role as a, um, a chemical mediators in the communication with the other species, other biotin species, and other uh, with bacteria and viruses uh, in the um, uh, in the oceans and with their predators like uh, copepods. Um, so I want to thank uh, all the institutions, the Assembled Class and the Project, all the institutions that host me, the people at CISIMA that uh, help and are still helping me, and all the people in the um, zoological that collaborated to these uh, works that I presented. And I leave you with an image of Naples. And if you have any questions, please do it. Thank you, Valeria. Uh, so if anyone wants to ask questions, please place it in the chat so that we can see who it is. Um, so we can see also that uh, the names of these factors are a bit uh, dated, I guess. You know, the, the diatoms don't have prost uh, prostate. Uh, <laughs> But uh, I, you know, you you were saying about communication with other organisms. But how about why shouldn't it be communication with the diatoms? Uh, do they don't they have receptors for for prostaglandins? Um, 
we just uh, we are still exploring uh, this part of the project because the project is quite new. So we just found this transporter, um, and uh, we are looking for uh, receptors now in the few in the next uh, few steps. This yeah. will be something that we will do. Because in in the fish, basically, prostaglandins are pheromones. Uh, yeah. You know, so that's that's one one uh, an example. Uh, of course, it's quite surprising that, that you find pr uh, prostaglandins in the plant uh, because they were discovered first in the animals, of course. But yeah, yeah. but uh, but it's it's very interesting, um, and there is no reason why they they shouldn't be there. Um, yes, that's why we are studying. In fact, in yeah. plants there are just few species that. Uh, um, looks like they have uh, prostaglandins, but this is how they are very, very old. And uh, they don't know, maybe they, they can be related to defense from uh, pathogens. Yes. Now we are doing experiments with, uh, with copepods to understand if um, they can be related to um, some way to- Some kind of immune response, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because of the, on the other hand, like you said, it's, these compounds are very short-lived. They don't, uh, they, 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 they're, uh, they're, they, let's say, they, they degrade very easily. Yes, and, yes, that's another yeah. problem, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. I don't see more questions in the chat. So we'll move on to the next talk. Thank you very much, uh, Valeria, and, uh, and good luck with the, with the project. Um, so the next talk is on a different subject. Uh, it's by Inge Martinek from the Swedish Museum of Natural History. And she's going to talk about eDNA uh, and the diversity of marine mixozoa. Please, Inge. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you see my presentation? Yes, we can see. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. Um, you just have to um, play to, it. To click it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> um, yeah. I'm Inga Martinek. I'm uh, working with the Swedish Museum of Natural History and the Institute of Parasitology in uh, the Czech Academy of Sciences. Um, yeah, I'm going to look at, or I am looking currently at whether you can reveal the diversity of myxozoans in marine environments using uh, eDNA. <clears throat> Short answer is yay, you can. This is uh, yeah, uh, a recent finding that I'm absolutely sure that it's working. Whether it is the total diversity though, yeah, um, that's uh, difficult to say partially because we don't know the diversity, but also uh, due to my findings, or rather we know that it isn't. But first of all, what are myxozoans in the first place? <clears throat> they are uh, cnidarians actually, they are endo, um, endoparasites. Um, <laughs> as the picture uh, suggests, they have been only recently reunited or classified into the, the um, cnidarians because of uh, the way uh, they look like, I'm coming back to that later, where in the cnidarians they go is disputed as generally, but uh, uh, the common consensus now is that they are uh, um, <clears throat> a sister group to the medusozoa. So you can see that there is quite a difference uh, because um, they are rather small. Um, they are parasites, as I mentioned. Um, the definitive host is um, or are annelids and bryozoans, <clears throat> so very ancient hosts, and uh, they produce actinospores, which float up in, in the water column and infect fish, uh, but also amphibians, birds, and mammals. And um, yeah, uh, those produce myxospores then, who sink to the bottom again. And uh, this is the life cycle. The uh, myxospores, which are these, as you can see, are rather diverse already in, uh, in their morphology, um, but they are very different uh, from the actinospores, or at least in, in many cases. So the two life stages had originally been classified as two different lineages based on morphology in as protists. So uh, there was a 
giant reshuffle in classification and taxonomy. And this is a task that is still ongoing <clears throat> because there have been many species described from different hosts, obviously, because they didn't know what the other counterpart is. And even with the advent of molecular data now um, to match them is very difficult because uh, in the invertebrate hosts, the prevalence is very, very low. <clears throat> so while we know um, more than 2,400 species now, um, complete life cycles, not proven in the lab, but just to know what the two hosts are, are um, very low. They are less than 100, uh, less than 60, I think. <clears throat> um, yeah. Uh, for the hosts, you can see, um, let me just do the laser pointer. Uh, yeah, they use bryozoans or analyte, uh, analytes of all kinds. <clears throat> um, I will be talking about the freshwater and the marine uh, clade. They are more delineated by the host, by the oligochete or polychete host, um, which is a problem because <laughs> Uh, these two groups are actually also defunct taxonomically nowadays. So um, yeah, it's not helping uh, deconstructing the whole problem here. In the vertebrate house, uh, they actually really did a huge um, uh, radiation from ancient fish lineages, such as uh, sharks and rays and chimeras to um, <clears throat> uh, Gnatus stones, and all kinds of fish lineages. But then they also went into amphibians, reptiles, birds, and there is even one genus that goes into shrews. <clears throat> so they even went all the way from um, aquatic and semi-aquatic environments to uh, terrestrial environments. <clears throat> so uh, my idea was to establish an assay to detect marine mixes or from marine environments using eDNA. Um, why to do that? Well, uh, in the um, ongoing biodiversity crisis, I think it's always good to know what's actually out there. And these guys are actually parasites. They can um, lead to rather nasty diseases in fish. Um, these are only examples of commercial fish. Um, so you can see carp in the bottom is trout here um, and salmon and they can lead to mortalities of up to 100%. So they are commercially important. The vast minority of them are commercially important, but in a changing world with uh, climate change, and uh, we don't know um, how fish under stress from climate change might react to parasites. So I think it would be a good idea to know what's going on in order to, um, to monitor and to take action possibly if something pops up. <clears throat> Traditionally, um, hang on, sorry, wrong direction. Um, the conventional method uh, to detect mixosomes is rather labor intensive. It is, you collect a lot of fish, you look at them from the outside, you look at them, you know, the skin, you look at the gills, you look at all the organs, at the muscle tissue. <clears throat> Most of it you have to look uh, under the microscope, not, e not every species of mixosome. Uh, makes these um, nice cysts that you can see with the naked eye. Uh, so you have to uh, squeeze uh, parts of the organs, look at the, under the microscope. If you have mature spores, they are rather easy to, to identify, especially when they are in the bio, for example, with nothing else. In uh, tissue, it's getting more difficult already. Um, if you have many spores, okay. If you have the developmental stages, you really need a highly trained expert uh, just to see that there is a myxozoan infection and which species that is, mm, no chance. So you have to go for molecular methods anyway. <clears throat> um, yeah, uh, for eDNA, the uh, first and or one of the first and crucial steps is primer design. And um, yeah, this is why I'm talking uh, about um, in the marine environment. This is the, the tree of uh, Myxozoa. I tried to find primers that would span the whole of the tree. 
I failed. Um, <clears throat> the Malakos Berean lineage here at the, at the bottom is um, very derived uh, from the rest. The Sparrowsporid lineage, although the connections here may not be correct, but this lineage here is very derived and has uh, in, um, inserts of up to a thousand base pairs, which uh, makes it especially in an NGS setting where you have only very uh, small fragments, very small amplicons that you can sequence very difficult to incorporate it, to not to have an extra essay for this particular branch. So yeah, I had to exclude these two. <clears throat> the next one, are then uh, the marine lineage, which is uh, defined by a polychaete host rather than, um, and the, uh, um, the freshwater lineage. <clears throat> I'm not interested in the freshwater environment so far, but, there are these nasty little branches that are from the freshwater have um, or that went from the freshwater into the marine environment. And I'm not interested in the one clade. I'm interested in the biodiversity of myxosomes in the marine environment. So I had to somehow try to include these guys in uh, in my primer design, <clears throat> uh, which led in the end uh, to me using uh, actually different primer com compositions to have primers for marine uh, for the marine group and the freshwater group because even uh, between the two the difference is enormous and difficult to cover. Um, the next thing to, uh, that is crucial for um, eDNA uh, analysis is sampling, extraction, and sequencing. The typical steps that you would do for basically anything uh, uh, molecular. Um, so eDNA you can take from water samples or from uh, here with the limnos. Um, you can use surface water, you can go deeper, mid water, you can go close to the bottom. Uh, or you can actually take sediments <clears throat> and try to extract uh, from the sediments. Um, surface water has the problem that, especially when since we are interested in the in the myxozoans only, I don't and I don't care for um, for bacteria, for algae, for uh, for fish um, in the sample, at least not at this stage. So. Um, the dilution factor is a big problem. So we try to take water um, as close to the bottom as possible, hoping that you know there would be some sort of concentration going on. Sediment samples would be very, very good, but uh, in the um, <clears throat> in the filtration step, it's really difficult to deal with uh, um, with sediment samples. Um, yeah. So here is just our lab. On the one side, there is the um, this is in Stasia. Uh, the um, vacuum pump that's basically all the time running in the background while you are on the other side dealing with your fish or your myofauna. Uh, this is uh, the next slide because um, I my plan was to take uh, samples from different geographical regions. First also to try um, my essay um, yeah, in, in different regions, whether um, it's working uh, in, in um, real uh, marine environments or in brackish environments and, and how they shift. <clears throat> and I wanted to take myofauna and fish um, sam uh, samples as well um, alongside the eDNA samples or the environmental samples um, as a test to, uh, to see, okay, with conventional meth methods, I find this diversity with my eDNA, I find that diversity, is there an overlap? Is there, uh, is one method uh, superior over the other? <clears throat> so uh, we did that together. And this is where um, Assemble was hugely helpful. <clears throat> um, yeah, I went to a lot of different places. Not all of them I visited actually uh, myself. Some of them I got samples from, uh, from my colleagues. Um, but this is my data set in the end. And um, Assemble allowed me to go to first um, to go to Stasia, Sint Eustachius. I still don't really know how to pronounce this <laughs> properly. It is uh, an island in the Eastern Caribbean. It's rather small, <clears throat> but it has absolutely awesome uh, uh, circumstances or conditions uh, for this type of sampling. There is a marine park around the island. 
there are coral reefs uh, and um, uh, seagrass bottoms, sandy bottoms. So in not too deep, uh, not too great a depth, you get a lot of different habitats. And um, uh, yeah, it's relatively easy to sample. Um, I had my colleague with me who helped uh, to, uh, um, especially with the fish dissections, and he was looking for metazoan parasites. So we were sharing the samples. That was a very, um, very good uh, um, labor and sample uh, sharing. It was more efficient as if I had come alone. And then um, Mazu and Kimani were very helpful in the field. Um, yeah, the island is absolutely amazing. Uh, I have never been in the Caribbean, but I didn't know that such a small island can have that many different species. If you go into the water, as you can see, just standing on the quay, there was, uh, there was already big fish swimming by the frigate birds. It was amazing. <clears throat> so we got fish mostly from, uh, from the fishermen. A few uh, small ones we caught also as bycatch, so to say, in um, in our uh, um, dredging, uh, they were entangled in the seaweeds that, uh, that we got. The diversity of annelids that uh, I was sampling as well was breathtaking. <laughs> um, I've been working with myofauna before, but this I've never seen. Um, yeah, uh, so we got a, a lot of um, annelid samples from this uh, site. Um, <clears throat> The second site uh, uh, where we went last year, it nearly didn't happen due to Corona, but we just slipped in, um, was Saili in Finland. We were visitors of the um, uh, Archipelago Research Institute, uh, where the sampling was, I have never had such a smooth cooperation <laughs> anywhere, it was absolutely amazing. Um, my colleague Jesus was uh, with me. We were sampling, we were concentrating mostly on um, environmental samples there. We got a lot of help from the staff at the, at the Institute. Um, I knew that the diversity would be lower, but um, I was surprised just that we were basically not able to get any marine uh, fish in this area. I knew that it would be low, but not that low. <laughs> and um, yeah, the uh, diversity of uh, <clears throat> well um, of annelids we found what we expected to find. We had a problem that uh, the the big winch was broken. It broke the day that we went out with a boat, so um, the numbers are unfortunately also not as high as I would have hoped. But um, yeah, we we found what we came for. <clears throat> this is just a small table to tell um, uh, what we actually sampled. I think these numbers are pretty high. When I was then coming home, having to process all these samples, <laughs> I was I was quite busy. Um, <clears throat> but I also, yeah, I do have some uh, some results. So the next is um, why am I doing it? Was what is the intended result? I'm mainly interested in the species compositions per locality. And then also um, to compare different localities, especially that's why I have samples or wanted to have samples from completely different um, marine regions to be able to, uh, um, to make an assessment about the um, complete diversity that is known or not known, to have um, areas that are well known compared to areas that are not uh, completely understudied and see how much we find there and how much of what we find is known. <clears throat> um, so the analysis, um, I have two trees here. Uh, this is the tree that I uh, made with um, the uh, uh, <laughs> from the freshwater primers. Uh, now I'm missing, amplicon is the word I'm missing. Uh, and from the marine uh, amplicon, uh, and you can see that there is this freshwater clade and the marine clade in both trees. <clears throat> and uh, with the fresh primers, I uh, got sequences in the fresh uh, um, clade that I didn't catch with the marine primers. Perfect, this is what I wanted, this is what I expected. Same with the marine primers. <clears throat> um, I use marine primers, I find them in the marine clade, 
but not uh, in the with the freshwater primers. So uh, there is no no overlap, but both catch what they are supposed to catch. I'm very happy about that. There is one curious case of this one here. This is uh, the um, a lineage of uh, freshwater myxosomes that have been have moved into the marine environment, but they belong to the freshwater clade uh, normally. Uh, but I caught them with the marine primers. As long as I catch them, but um, it's a curious case to point out. Here is even a nice uh, case where I um, caught one sequence with both primers. And when I um, concatenated them together and blasted them together, they actually turned out to be from the same species. <clears throat> oh, I don't know about the same, spe same species, but they perfectly align. There is nothing, there is no, uh, no chimera uh, going on. Uh, the, both parts come up with the same, uh, uh, yeah, with the same sequence. So this is also nice because then you have a rather long, um, a long contact of about 500 uh, um, base pairs. And that actually, uh, yeah, is a nice thing to uh, identify a species on or to build a tree on. Um, for the comparison uh, of eDNA versus conventional screening, in this one here, again, the tree that I made uh, from the freshwater primers and the marine primers, the contacts, the green ones are the environmental uh, sequences, the red ones are uh, the ones that are found in fish screenings. <clears throat> and um, yeah, in, in the freshwater, there's absolutely no overlap. Um, in the marine uh, um, contacts or a tree, there is actually here this area, but if you look at it uh, more closely, this looks already rather, rather nicely resolved in the tree. <clears throat> and if you look at the, um, uh, at the alignment, it's also really clear that these must be different species because uh, they must be myxozoans actually because they, they perfectly align um, along uh, all the uh, the regions, the conserved regions, but also the um, uh, the slightly more variable regions. But uh, they are never. Um, it's um, yeah about uh, three hundred base pairs. But the maximum ID between any of these sequences is ninety six percent. So um, curiously, I do not find the um, the diversity that I would expect there because I found mature spores in the fish. <clears throat> so you would expect the, the spores also to be in the environment, uh, but I do find other diversity. Um, the one thing, this uh, particular example is uh, from St. Eustachius and uh, the fisherman was not willing to disclose exactly where he, um, where he collected the fish. So I was not able to 100% sample at the same locality. Uh, we knew that it must be in the in the area, but this uh, goes into the discussion of um, how uh, environmental DNA is transported and how long it lasts. So um, this may be, uh, you know, the temporal and geographical scale uh, um, might be rather small in, uh, uh, for the detection in this um, essay. This would be something that needed to be tested more rigorously in a more um, controlled environment. Yeah, I would like to thank um, yeah, uh, my home institutions, uh, Naturhistorische Rijksmuseet and Institute of Parasitology, but and the two funding bodies. Without Assemble, uh, it would have been much, much more difficult. I have been uh, at the Nagoya Protocol uh, meeting before the workshop. I was also baffled by this. I tried to do everything right. And assembly helps a lot uh, in this. I hope this will continue. Thank you. Thank you, Inga. That was uh, uh, very interesting. And certainly, this question of DDNA is not going to be easy. Um, so I think you are, in fact, breaking two barriers. One is all this diversity of hidden hidden diversity, and the second is to try to use a technique that, in reality, is still 
you know, being developed or, or yeah. it's controversial, let's say, in some ways. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I, is there any, any other questions or any questions? No? Ah. Okay, Ulf, you can, you can ask the question. <laughs> yes, yes. Hi, Inga. Hi. <laughs> Thanks uh, for a nice talk. Uh, I, was just, I was just a little bit curious. Can you say something about uh, the completeness of the, the reference database that you're matching these uh, environmental sequences against? Yes, and I am. Yeah, sorry. No, and also, are you finding? I mean, are you finding? I mean, lo lots of new diversity. Are you also finding uh, indications of maybe synonymy or things like that? Um, uh, the completeness of the database. Um, the database that I used is one that I'm in the process of curating. This mm. is uh, one uh, project. Um, I'm working with the UGREF project there. Um, it's, they normally go for uh, protest uh, <clears throat> or eukaryotic uh, um, branches and try to, uh, yeah, to create a database that, uh, so that you can use eDNA data and just throw it against it. But um, yeah, they also curate metazoan data and I'm uh, in the process of doing um, that. So I'm trying to really find uh, uh, throw out false uh, sequences, chimeric sequences, but um, it's including all the data that there is and um, hopefully correct ones. <clears throat> this is far from complete. That is absolutely sure because there are plenty of names out there that, um, uh, that have been described in 1900, uh, obviously without any uh, really uh, good um, vouchers or um, and certainly with no DNA. So this is why I'm saying there is an ongoing uh, reclassification of the taxonomy currently. And there is very little um, that you, it's like with nematodematids and acids, there is very little morphologically that you can actually point to <clears throat> often enough. So how what did you how did you match them and the sequences to your your uh, to the names? I mean, what kind of method did you use for that uh, algorithm? Wise, I mean, uh, was it an alignment based method or? or... Oh yeah, th this is tree based exactly. Um, uh, I'm just uh, I I have this database um, and I um, add my new sequences into this, build a tree, uh, rexamel tree, and um, and see where the um, where the closest um, yeah comparison is. <clears throat> this is a problem because in order to to make a, a proper match, a proper taxonomic assignment, you need a, f a very good database in the first place, as little uh, as complete as possible, and um, as long as um, a segment as uh, possible. So next generation sequencing allows for if you go for Illumina uh, 300 uh, base pair paired end. So you may have a 500 uh, base pair possible uh, <clears throat> uh, amplicon, but then you have to also find, you know, a piece of DNA that actually fits there with the primers. So I also have only uh, like 300 base pairs. That's the only thing where it makes sense to have it conserved enough at the sides and variable enough in the, in, uh, in the middle. So this is why primary design is absolutely crucial. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No other questions? Okay, we're just a couple of minutes away from the next talk. So just wait a bit. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you, Inga. It was very nice and uh, good luck. <laughs> Thank you, bye. First-class scientific research relies on effective, convenient access to tools, facilities, and data. Assemble Plus is a European Union-funded research and innovation program 
with a consortium of over 20 partners that integrates key marine research facilities across Europe and beyond, offering access to top-tier research infrastructure through a competitive application procedure, evaluated on the basis of a feasibility assessment and research excellence. Whether from academia, industry or policy, through its easy and straightforward application process, Assemble Plus provides scientists with on-site or remote access to biological resources, varied ecosystems, experimental facilities, technology platforms, e-infrastructure and expertise, and provides lodging and catering support over the course of their placement. Assemble Plus also performs its own networking and research activities, ranging from interacting with new users and businesses, to cryobanking marine organisms, to providing diving services for researchers. Over the course of the project, as well as providing access, Assemble Plus aims to strengthen transnational and multidisciplinary networks, create public-private partnerships, enable new technologies and services, upskill researchers, and improve the long-term sustainability of Europe's marine biological stations. So, if you are a researcher in need of access to marine infrastructure, such as laboratories, equipment, or any other provision, Assemble Plus welcomes proposals for access on a rolling basis from the 29th of August 2018 to the 30th of October 2020. For more information about the project and call for access, please visit www.assembleplus.eu. So we'll continue in the same line, trying to uh, access biodiversity using molecular methods. And, uh, and uh, so the next talk will be by Pedro Vieira. He's from the University of Minho, that's in Braga in the north of Portugal. And he's going to talk about novel insights into marine invertebrate biodiversity under a molecular perspective. So please, Pedro. So, hello. Can you see? Yeah, we can see and listen. Okay, cool. Thank you. So, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Pedro Vieira. I'm from University of Minho. And uh, today I will not uh, talk only about the work I've been developing, but also the work we have been developing in the MIBAR code group here at CBMA University of Minho. So, as you know, uh, marine vertebrates. Uh, Nowadays, more than 1 million species were described for marine for invertebrates, sorry. Um, uh, uh, however, only a few are uh, still listed in the, the, red, uh, the red book. Uh, but we know that uh, vertebrates uh, are declining uh, uh, rapidly. Um, and the funds uh, nowadays are still uh, not, uh, more allocated to vertebrates than to invertebrates. Uh, for instance, uh, in a, uh, Europe, uh, uh, funds are six times more time allocated to vertebrates than to invertebrates. Uh, marine biodiversity is still understudied when compared with other habitats, like terrestrial and freshwater ones. However, a major uh, uh, feel of uh, multicellular animals occur in the sea and half of them are endemic and uh, most more than 90 percent of uh, marine species are invertebrate and we know that uh, marine habitats are threatened uh, namely the coastal ones uh, by anthropogenic impacts or due to habitat loss and so on so it's more important than ever to know and understand the biodiversity that occurs in these marine habitats. And usually nowadays, uh, species identification is based on morphology. However, uh, morphology-based identifications have some problems because there is no master key that can, can be used to identify all groups of many animals. It can be sorry, time consuming, it requires uh, experts, uh, it is not uh, applicable uh, sometimes to juveniles or broken animals and uh, the phenotype, phenotype can be variable. All of this can lead to taxonomic impediment. The disease, we uh, never reach the full taxonomic knowledge of the taxonomy. 
So, a molecular approach can be a good alternative. They will not substitute morphology, but can, they can be a good alternative. They have several advantages. Uh, they have a great timing cost effectiveness. They are easy to automate. They can be applicable to any life stage, or even if you just have a fragment of the animal, and enables to identify species of, uh, in large blocks of life. You can apply to single animals or to uh, groups of animals and can tackle uh, complex marine communities. A molecular approach can be, uh, be based on DNA, RNA, protein-based methods. However, in our group, we work with DNA sequence that uh, uh, to the, uh, nowadays is in uh, uh, phase three. But we have been uh, focusing on DNA barcoding uh, that uh, is applied to single specimens and DNA beta barcoding in DNA that is applied to multi-animals and environmental samples. Usually, DNA barcoding and meta barcoding rely uh, on CO1, on animals, although other genetic markers can be used. Uh, molecular approach has several advantages, like I said, and it can, uh, we can um, identify multiple uh, spe species and see uh, community composition and diversity across habitats. But we have been seeing that usually this molecular approach can detect more species that, uh, than morphology. And we have been tackling this issue and comparing both uh, methodologies in our group. Uh, for instance, in this work, we've been using uh, artificial plates that were uh, 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 new niche to uh, seaside and um, uh, mobile uh, fauna. And we have been observing that overall DNA meta barcoding can detect more species than morphology and uh, also across across time and in different um, different taxonomic uh, groups. Uh, but in our group, we are also very interested to see uh, uh, what genetic information is available. Um, so, uh, for instance, in this uh, group of crustaceans, the Perkeri, they are benthic. We try to understand what genetic information was available for, for this group in the genetic database. And uh, for instance, we observed that meto metogenomes and whole genomes are not that uh, present, they are higher. But uh, for instance, there are some uh, already some records of CO1 for this group. However, if we observe the distribution, the geographical distribution across the globe of these records, uh, are uh, more than 80% are just for the North Atlantic. So this geographic distribution is not equal across the globe. And we, we have been trying to see this uh, genetic information, if it is available. So for instance, in Iberian Peninsula and also in the Macronesia Islands of Assurge, Madeira and Canaries in the Northeast of Atlantic, we have been observing that uh, only around one third of the species present here have uh, uh, DNA, uh, sequence of CO1. Uh, I, did, I do not show here, but for instance, for fish, uh, fish have uh, around 70%. So still much work to do to, in uh, marine vertebrates. But not just uh, native species have uh, CO1 sequence lacking, also uh, no indigenous ones. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, no indigenous species in Europe, also more, more uh, most groups do not have uh, uh, more than 50% of sequence in Europe. So when will this uh, CO1 sequence be uh, available? Well, we do not know, but uh, at least for Macaronesia, it seems that uh, it will take uh, some decades uh, to, to be reach that level, at least at the, the current uh, rate. Um, well, the species concept is uh, quite complex. Uh, but usually is uh, based on uh, morphology. Uh, however, uh, uh, molecular approach can detect uh, some molecular entities uh, that can be called by many names like lineage, beams, but also operational taxonomic units or motus. 
And usually one uh, morphological spe species correspond to one of these motus. However, in some cases we have high variability within a species uh, and one species can correspond to several motus. And in this case, we call a critical species and we are in the presence of a hidden diversity. And recently, uh, last year, we developed this uh, software called BEX that among other things, can detect this hidden diversity in um, reference libraries and in database. And uh, we have been observing that, uh, at least in Ibidin Peninsula and Macronesia, we can see here in gray and here in blue, that uh, many species display this hidden diversity in the, the database. Also, when we observe our data from the periphery, from the, the world, here in green, uh, are higher than 100, you can see that many families uh, display case of hidden diversity. So we want to further explore this hidden diversity and we went to coasts uh, in Europe, um, and but also in Africa, but mainly here in the islands of Macronesia, we are being focused on these islands. Also some studies uh, we have been going to the Mediterranean and that's why last year we went to the Hellenic Center of Marine Research uh, in Crete, Greece, to sample and collect some animals as well. So now I will show some uh, case studies where we have been found this uh, hidden diversity in different uh, marine vertebrates. For instance, this, uh, in this case, in this isopod, in Amen Edwarsi, we found that uh, this, um, these species were, uh, had actually nine motus and these motus uh, corresponded or were segregated in different islands and regions and that the, the different motus do not, did not share uh, or at least the, the, the gene flow was reduced between these regions. And most of the variation within these uh, uh, species was due to the difference between regions. But we also observe in these species that the, the, the different motus diverge millions of years ago, uh, probably uh, before the rise of sea level uh, 20,000 years ago. Um, uh, and also that uh, most of these motus were endemic, we can see here the colors, to group of, groups of islands. And that this diversification was not uh, related with the age of the islands or geographic distance, but to stochastic events and probably to founder takes all process. This means that uh, 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 new, uh, new settlers could not uh, establish and uh, pass on genetic information on already established uh, populations. Then we wanted to see uh, in other groups, uh, in this case, we observed that in this uh, family, Yalidi uh, amphipods, uh, we try to see the genetic variation in each species and we observe uh, uh, interesting patterns. Only uh, some species display this high uh, genetic uh, variation. And we observed that only the species with populations in Macronesia displays this high genetic diversity with uh, more uh, uh, genetic variation in the Macronesian populations when compared with the ones from the continent, from uh, Morocco, Ibinian Peninsula, and Europe. So in the end, we observed that from seven initial species, we had more than 25 motus, and most of these motus were from Macronesia region. So after seeing these two groups, we wanted to know uh, was possible to observe these patterns in more uh, in other species of Pracarida of this uh, of this group. So for that we used uh, uh, more hundreds of specimens and 23 species, and we did a meta species analysis. Uh, uh, of course, we used uh, only species uh, with populations present in uh, Macronesia and uh, uh, the continent. And yes, we observed that the populations from these two regions were uh, different. The, there was a genetic uh, variation between these two populations. And we observed that the populations from Macronesia display higher number of motus, higher genetic variation when compared with the ones from the continent. We also observed that the populations 
from the islands were more similar uh, among them, and the populations from the continent were also more similar among them. Also, uh, we uh, observed that despite uh, the geographic proximity, the populations from the islands were different from the continent, and the uh, uh, gene flow between them was uh, hard or absent, and probably uh, geographic discontinuity, we cannot say a barrier here, but probably uh, geographic discontinuity uh, may, may occur here. Um, we also observe any interesting to, 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 to see if these uh, motus in the future are uh, described as new species. This would mean that in the future, probably we'll have just for this group, at least 60 new species only in this small region. And most of them, of course, from the Kurnizi Islands. So this would mean a lot. But not just in uh, perichorites, we observe this pattern. We also wanted to observe this in uh, polychaetes. And um, for instance, in uh, this polychaete that is, uh, we observed that this species displayed more than 30 motus in four major groups. And these groups were segregated geographically with most of them being allopatric, only with uh, here in the Baltic region, uh, different uh, groups being uh, uh, in the same region. Uh, also in the, this uh, case, the Perinerase, uh, we observe allopatric um, segregation. Also in Crete, we were able to, to see a, at least a, a motto that is uh, endemic to the East uh, Mediterranean, but once again, more uh, endemic motus from Macronesia Islands, not present in other place. But it's interesting to see that in this species, uh, different motus co-occur in the same region, a pattern that we observe as well in Platin Range. In this case, we can uh, see that many motus co-occur in the same region. Uh, the same happens in Crete, although there is one, uh, uh, at least to our knowledge, one endemic uh, motu. But once again, we can observe that in Macaronesia Islands, we have endemic, not observed in other place uh, motus, diversity not observed in other place, and only present here. So uh, in conclusion, um, we observed that uh, marine coastal invertebrates, uh, at least uh, benthic perichorites and polychaetes, may not be as cosmopolitan as previously thought. Uh, molecular tools are, of course, uh, useful and very important to detect this hidden diversity. And the, that marine realm, and especially islands, may have more uh, diversity, at least genetic diversity, and more species uh, than we expected. And Islands seem to be important uh, place uh, for marine invertebrate evolution in diversification. And of course, uh, we still need uh, more genetic information to achieve uh, um, more solid conclusions and uh, the database need to be uh, completed. I want to finish uh, by thanking the MIBAR code group uh, and other colleagues from the University of Aveiro and also to Panagioti that received me and Marcus last year in the Hellenic Center of Marine Research in Crete. Uh, thank. And I want to finish by inviting everyone that uh, has works on the marine evolution of marine invertebrates to submit uh, works to our special issue. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Pedro. So that's um, that's interesting. So I think that also uh, thinking about and uh, the the presentation by Esther Serrão earlier last well last week. Yes. That uh, the climate change. That's you know the, the fact that they, they are in the islands also and and they've diversified there suggests they may not be moving very far. So that will be a question whether they, these populations are stable for the future. Yeah, that's, uh, uh, that's important. So what to realize there is that, uh, so these species may not be as cosmopolitan as we thought. So maybe this uh, lineage 
they are only present in these islands, sometimes in small uh, uh, locations. So they are important from a conservation point of view. Mm -hmm. So we have uh, monitor, understand them because of this global change, climate change, uh, because they can disappear. They are vulnerable in mm -hmm. this place. Okay. Any questions from the audience? Seems as if not. <laughs> well, thank you, Pedro. And uh, thank you for the invitation. <laughs> thank you. So while we wait, uh, so let's have the the draw of the three vouchers for uh, purchases from NHBS. So NHBS has uh, supported us with this uh, with these vouchers. Uh, so the way we're going to do it is um, so we have the list of all the the participants and in fact the the number of times that they have uh, they have been in the talks and so that the, the ones that um, that have been more often to to listen to the talks will have uh, a higher chance and we're going to use the google generator to select uh, the 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 um, so the number uh, so each 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 uh, each each viewing is a, is uh, associated with a number and so uh, we'll generate the random number and Andrea will will read out who is the person that got the voucher so I'll show you I'll share the screen so that you can see uh, let's see if I get it right there it is okay so there are, there are 1459 views so that's uh, people that came to watch the um, the conference and and has been in several of these talks and so we'll generate the first one there you go 761 so which one it is andrea it's 761. luigi caputi Okay, so we'll send an email with the voucher to Luigi Caputi. We'll go for the next one. 1056. Just a minute, sorry. Simona Yanusi. Okay, and the third one, 196. One nine six. Dalit Meron. And that's it. So we just gave away three vouchers. They'll receive the voucher uh, in their uh, in their email. Okay. Okay. So now we'll uh, we'll continue for the last talk of the Assemble Plus. A conference, uh, and and so the the last talk is by Daniel Van Prasert. He is uh, on the west coast of the U.S. I think at this time, and so it's still early there, <clears throat> and he's going to be talking about light harvesting and optical properties of mesophotic corals. Please, Daniel, go ahead. Yeah, good morning. Well, good, good evening to you and uh, thank you for the introduction. I wasn't aware that I was literally the last speaker, so so uh, thanks for accommodating that. Um, okay, I'm just gonna share my screen and jump into it. Yeah, that's okay. fine. Great. Um, so, um, I'm going to talk about um, how uh, corals uh, harvest light and, and uh, their optical and bioptical properties in, 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 uh, in, in the uh, deep sea, in the mesophotic, so, um, so uh, in, in these very light limited regions. And um, so this was a, a funded December Plus project um, that uh, was, back then I was at the University of Cambridge, so UK based. And um, and with uh, in collaboration with uh, Tel Aviv University uh, with uh, Yossi Loya's lab, uh, and uh, they also have the, the field station at the Nelat uh, DIUI. 
And um, so I have to say this, this whole talk has been uh, done by this uh, excellent PhD student, uh, Nathaniel Kramer, so Nati, and he uh, composed all of those slides. So all the beautiful pictures are his, not mine. And um, so, yeah, um, basically, let's see. Um, so um, the, most of you will know that uh, corals are uh, symbiotic animals. Um, you have this interaction between these microscopic algae that uh, are embedded within the, the animal host tissue here. And um, so the, the interaction is, is um, uh, mutually beneficial um, where the algae photosynthesize and uh, provide uh, uh, energy towards the coral host. And uh, the uh, coral host in return pro provides a home uh, provides shelter and provides uh, junk food, essential essential nutrients for for algal metabolism to occur, and um, and so th there's there's a lot of other things that the coral host actually does, and that is um, largely understudied. And actually, my work has uh, dealt uh, with the, the optical properties, um, and um, really the way I, I see a coral host is as a light modulator. So the, the structural properties of the, the coral skeleton and the coral tissue um, are strongly optimized to, to, um, for photosynthesis under varying light conditions. And um, now the, um, the algae provide uh, the major, um, in, in most cases, a, a large source of the, the carbon requirements of the, um, of the animal host. Um, uh, all the studies have shown it is uh, can cover over ninety percent. So it, it it makes sense for the coral host to um, you know to to be able to regulate it to some extent. And um, so um, I've done a lot of studies uh, studying these uh, bio-optical properties under in, in shallow waters. And uh, basically, the um, the uh, one of the the main results is that. Uh, Colts are very efficient at using light. Um, so they're, they're able to, uh, to really optimize the internal light distribution. Um, and, um, and, and, and this allows them to, uh, to have these uh, very outstanding photosynthetic quantum efficiencies. And of course, this is at the heart of this beautiful coral reef that you see here. Now, um, what uh, when I teamed up with uh, Yossi Loya's lab, uh, what, what the question was really is so um, so how do, how does this happen in in, in light limited regions? So let's say 50 meters or deeper, um, where where corals are strongly light limited. So you have a strong spectral shift. The incident light is uh, is uh, shifted, largely blue driven, and it's very low. So um, so how uh, how is it possible that uh, you know these mesophotic cores are still thriving um, to some extent, and um, is there an, a modulation in, in terms of the the optical properties um, and adjustment? And uh, so here you can see an example of these uh, mesophotic reefs. There, um, I think that must be from Elat as well. Um, and so so the the question was really. Um, are the optical and physiological properties of, of uh, deep reef corals um, adjusted or well better at using low light than than, than shallow corals? And um, to uh, to do this, um, we I went to the IUI, so that's here uh, in in Elat, at the Inter University Institute for Marine Sciences. Here you see uh, Professor Yossi Loya and his PhD student Nati Grammer, <coughs> excuse me, who's done most of this work. And, um, and uh, yeah, so um, we, we did a bunch of things. And I think the, uh, the, the interesting thing and the challenge thing, challenging thing really was to combine, um, you know, ecological scale uh, approaches with, um, very detailed uh, micro scale uh, measurements of the uh, bio optical properties. And so um, uh, we, we collected corals from, from shallow waters, but also from uh, mesophotic, uh, mesophotic depth at about 45 meters in a lot, collected a range of different species. And then we employed a suite of techniques that we've uh, 
successfully applied previously with shallow water calls to really understand um, how they use light. And um, so some of these uh, methods that uh, we previously developed are briefly summarized here. Um, so when we, when we talk about, let's say, optical properties, um, there's one can uh, distinguish uh, briefly between two, two different things. Uh, one is the uh, kind of apparent optical properties. So apparent optical properties, these are basically the light, the light environment. So, so um, let's say, um, what is the actual uh, quantum flux that is incident on, on an algal cell within a host tissue? So um, this you would measure with um, a small sensor, a spherical sensor, that you can embed inside the coral tissue. So this would be the, the scalar irradiance, um, which quantifies the light field from 360 degrees. And, um, and then of course, what, what people uh, often do because it's easy to do is just to measure the diffuse reflectance. So you just take a fiber optic probe, you have incident light coming from the top, and then you measure the light um, that comes back from the surface uh, and you resolve that spectrally and, and, and that, that's the diffuse reflectance. So um, the diffuse reflectance is easy to measure, um, gives you an idea of you know, uh, what's in the tissue, what's in the coral, in terms of pigment and so on. Um, and then the spectral scale irradiance, <clears throat> we, we use these microsensors. You can see one here actually, and that sensor is embedded uh, within the tissue. So we use um, um, a micromanipulator, an automated micromanipulator then, that we then move um, at, at, at steps of a couple of hundred micrometers through the tissue towards the skeleton. So we can really get a good idea of how much light the algae receive inside the tissue. Now, <clears throat> the, the other more, I would say more challenging, uh, the other more challenging parameters to, to quantify are what, what are called the inherent optical properties. And these are really um, the inherent parameters that uh, determine the uh, light propagation in, in, in such a, a medium. So in, in, this, in this case, these are called. So, so the question becomes, um, what is the probability that light is absorbed within that medium? And of course, this is a function of the number of agar cells and the chlorophyll A content and so on. And what's the probability that light is scattered? And um, <clears throat> from shallow water calls, um, we, we know that, um, for instance, the, the, both the coral tissue and the skeleton are very good at scattering light in a way that it uh, can promote photosynthesis. And um, so, so here's see an example of um, these uh, radial uh, uh, reflectance measurements where you use a laser here and um, you see the incident beam, that's where the image is oversaturated. And then, but you also see the scattering, you know, in, in all directions. So, and with a microsensor, you can resolve this, uh, this diffusely scattered light and this gives you an idea about the, the scattering properties with certain assumptions and certain calculations. And so, um, so what we did in, in, in this study was um, to um, resolve these different um, uh, yeah, optical properties. And um, now one thing, I'm sorry, Nati did not include, but we also did a bunch of uh, photosynthesis measurements. So using standard techniques such as uh, chlorophyll A fluorometry, but also using um, um, you know respirometry and 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 so on and and um, getting a good idea about the uh, you know net uh, photosynthetic efficiency of our our studied species, and we did this in a comparative manner comparing shallow and and deep sea calls, and you can see the calls here. Um, so we uh, we chose uh, Acropora. Uh, sclerosa, um, pruritus paresi, um, paramatosphera paresi, and pruritus lobata, and stalofa pistillata. And, you know, um, the first time you see this, and if you're not familiar with um, corals and, and, and also deep sea corals, I think it's quite striking, you know, to see this morphological transformation on, on all spatial scales, you know. So, for instance, here, a shallow water coral, you can already visually see it looks very pale, and the architecture is very round and convoluted. And um, as you go towards a deep sea coral, you see how it's much darker and the architecture has also changed. It's much more flat. And, um, and so there, there is um, quite um, uh, uh, fascinating range of architectural changes. And um, 
And so, of course, some of these have been documented previously, but what, not, what has not been documented in detail really was um, the uh, good understanding of the bio-optical properties. And um, so here's really pretty much an example of the death uh, gradient uh, in ELAT and uh, how the light intensity changes. So what you can see really is um, that uh, 40, 45 uh, meters, there's only, it's less than 10%, I think down to 5% of the incident surface irradiance or five to three, I think. So, so um, under certain conditions. So it's, 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 it's very little. Um, oops, sometimes, yeah. Um, now, uh, so, so, some first results. Um, so first, um, focus on, on these three calls. So variety, stylophoram, varieties, and, and this graph might be a bit difficult to read, um, but what you can see is that the, the reflectance is uh, spectrally resolved. That's between 400 to 700 nanometers, that's visible light. And then there is measurements done on uh, the bare skeleton first. So just look at the, um, the light orange and the, uh, the, the red uh, grass <clears throat> and uh, uh, lights. And, and so what you can see that if you um, strip the tissue and you just um, measure the diffuse reflectance on the skeleton um, of, of these corals, and then you do that for the deep sea corals and the mesophotic corals and the shallow water corals, you can see that in most cases, the reflectivity is strongly enhanced. So you see here, there's about 20% change. Here as well, there's quite a, some significant change in here as well. Let's ignore Acropa for a second, uh, um, which is an exception. But um, in, 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 in most cases, and you see there's a strong enhancement in the, in the reflectivity. Now, um, if you uh, look at the, uh, the total diffuse reflectance that comes from the life coral, now, of course, um, what, you, what you see, the major contributor of this um, uh, the spectral pro profile, of course, is um, you have a very high density of, of, of algae in, in, in the tissue. Now, um, and of course, you, you can see this according to the dip in chlorophyll A here at 675, um, which, which is very strong. And what, what you can see, of course, is that um, uh, in, in the mesophoto calls, uh, there's less light available than in the shallow water calls, but uh, actually it's not so different. Um, uh, so so um, if we uh, continue and um, look at uh, Stalophora, um, we, we did measurements on the, um, the total chlorophyll A density <clears throat> and the alga symbiont density. And um, what, what we can see is a strong upregulation, of course, of, uh, of uh, uh, the microalgal density and also the chlorophyll A content. And um, and, um, and and with that comes an upregulation in the in the diffuse reflectance. So um, now the one of the the key hypotheses or the, the key, um, yeah, the key hypothesis that came out from doing this study actually was that um, we, we believe there's a, a direct uh, interaction between, you know, um, pigment upregulation, simian upregulation and, and, and uh, the reflectance. So there's some kind of feedback um, in terms of adjustment and how light is used as you, as you go towards deeper depth. And so um, if you think about, okay, well, we, we increase algal density, um, you would in, uh, absorb more light. However, um, however, at some point, um, you can also suffer from self-shading of uh, the microalgal cells. And um, so at some point, it becomes less efficient to invest more into pigments and, 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 and cells. So, um, so, what um, what uh, we uh, we did we, we 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 actually measured exactly what is the available light inside the tissue um, in in these calls, and what you can see is so that's a profile of the scalar irradiance. Again, that's a sensor that measures light from all directions, and what you can see is that the uh, where's the legend here? 
um, that so dark blue is a mesophote and light blue is a shallow water that uh, the mesophote calls the mesophote calls um, uh, th there is less light available as you go deep into the tissue but um, if you consider um, how much uh, cell density there actually is and how um, how, how dense chlorophyll A is, is actually not that bad. So, um, so our hypothesis is that um, as you, uh, if you have higher upregulation of, of, of pigments, you, the core skeleton actually optimizes that by improving the light scattering uh, properties. And, um, and so you can see an example of this as well uh, between different uh, spatial areas in the core. So there is the uh, sinusoc, um, there's the uh, sinusoc tissue here, the connecting tissue, and then there's the polyp tissue. And um, in this very uh, complicated graph, <laughs> if we can resolve it, you can see that now um, the sinusoc is the solid line and the polyp is the dotted line. So let's look at the skeleton first, so the bare skeleton. So over the bare skeleton, um, the uh, shallow and mesophotic um, is very similar in terms of uh, the scalar radiance. But if you compare the uh, sinusoc um, and uh, uh, if, you, if you look at the polyp, you can see that there is a um, strong difference, <coughs> excuse me, in the, um, in the light scattering or in the, um, in the uh, in the available uh, light. Um, so, so um, what, what do we have here? Um, yeah, so, 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 so there are stronger uh, spatial differences as well. And we, we then did um, some more detailed uh, correlation where we um, would uh, correlate um, the amount of cells inside uh, the tissue with the diffuse reflectance of the skeleton. And um, except for aquapora, huh, um, most corals kind of adhere to, to this. So with higher cell densities, there's higher skeletal reflectance. Um, so, so the hypothesis is, 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 uh, is, as I said, so they have this uh, upregulation of pigments in relation to enhanced uh, skeletal reflectivity. You can uh, quantify that uh, in a bit more detail by, um, by characterizing these uh, inherent optical properties um, uh, using some, some models that we previously developed for shallow water calls. And, um, and this here um, shows the reduced scattering coefficient and that's the absorption coefficient. So, um, so uh, and th that, that is of the skeleton. And, um, and uh, if you take these values of the, um, the skeletal scattering, and you take the values of the, the tissue absorption, and then you put this, uh, you can put this in a model, in a, in, in a probability light distribution model, which is a, a Monte Carlo simulation. Um, uh, then what, what you can see is that, in fact, the, the mesophotic calls absorb about three times more light than uh, the shallow water calls. Um, so they, they, there's a um, strong enhanced efficiency in terms of uh, um, collecting light. Um, <clears throat> now, a few notes on, um, on uh, what our findings imply in terms of, um, you know, uh, using or the ability of mesophotic calls to serve as a refuger for uh, climate change impacts. Um, now, one thing is that uh, people think, well, it's deep sea, they're unlikely to, to bleach. However, um, what we learned from the study was that uh, the scattering coefficient of the of the calls is, is very low, and um, there's some some nice uh, work done um, by by uh, a group at uh, North Northwestern University that shows really that the the scattering coefficient relates to bleaching susceptibility, where lower scatter coefficient uh, coefficient relates to enhanced bleaching susceptibility. In our case, we found that mesophotic calls had a much lower scattering coefficient. And of course, with that comes the enhanced reflectivity. Again, another, another um, uh, parameter is the microalgal cell density. 
There has been studies showing that uh, microalgal cell density affects uh, bleaching susceptibility. And this is largely because <clears throat> with more cells in the tissue, you uh, evolve more oxygen. And with that comes the, the enhanced likelihood that you develop toxic oxygen, so reactive oxygen species, which are um, underlying this disassociation of the, uh, the coal agar symbiosis and effectively lead to coal bleaching. So, um, so really, there are uh, a few parameters that are somewhat concerning, which suggest that, yes, they are very good at using low light, but at the same time, it might render them more susceptible from, from uh, climate change impacts. So this is um, something to, to look into in the future and to really see how uh, resilient these calls are. Um, yeah, um, so, so, so really uh, what we put forward here is that um, the uh, mesophotic calls here are, are very efficient at using light. And this is powered by this combination between the enhanced skeletal optical properties and uh, which favor light absorption per cell. And um, again, uh, thanks to, uh, to Nati for putting the, these slides together. Um, and um, so, uh, yeah, I think you did a great job there. And uh, th thank you all for listening um, and uh, meeting you virtually. Um, if you have any uh, questions um, about calls and optics and so on, or interested in collaborating, you can always send me an email. Uh, this is my new email at UCSD here in San Diego and I'm happy to talk to you more. Thank you, Danielle. Uh, so we actually have a question here from Jana Efremova. Can you ask the question aloud, Jana? Uh, yeah, hello, do you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, hello, Daniel. Thank you for your um, interesting talk. Um, I wanted to ask if you have some information how it is uh, um, with the pigments and the upregulation of the photosynthetic um, efficiency in caves, because I'm actually working with sponges in caves. Uh, and I, yeah, I would just, I just uh, observed that many of those species are rather loose pigments. And I rather find more bleached um, species inside of the caves. Mm -hmm. um, however, I, I just wanted to know if you have there some information. Uh, sounds very interesting. Uh, wh wh what do you mean by loose pigments? Uh, that the same uh, species outside of the cave would be, for example, violet, uh, and inside of the cave it would be white. I see. Ah, okay, so, so um, I, I'm not so familiar with uh, sponges, but from corals I know that there has been some studies, you know, looking at um, at um, uh, you know uh, light harvesting in different environments, uh, mm. including caves. There's been this one study by Ken Anthony. I forgot which year, but um, you know it is largely driven by light. Uh, given that uh, the light availability is reduced inside a cave as well, um, you you might expect uh, similar uh, mechanisms. Mm. Um, yeah. Of course, there's other ecological. Uh, yeah factors to consider such as predation, nutrient availability, and so on that might be, you know, that, that are not only related to light, but uh, largely um, you, you um, I would assume that uh, um, at least we know in terms of pigments and cell density that much of this can be triggered as well um, in a light gradient. Now yeah. um, the, I would say this adjustment in, in the skeletal properties, um, you know, I, we don't, we don't know yet exactly how, how this mm. works. Um, uh, it might, we might be able to reproduce something over longer time scales in, in, the, in the laboratory setting as a function of light, but I don't know. Uh, um, so, um, and, uh, and then, uh, yeah, so I assume that the, the reason why they're bleached is, you know, you, so you have, uh, you have some uh, photosymbionts in these sponges, right? Yes, cyanobacteria yeah, so, mainly. Yeah, so you probably have less in the cave because then it's probably um, mm. more heterotrophic than phototrophic. Yeah, so exactly. It, um, yeah, I mean, that, that, that happens as well, right? So mm. um, as you go deeper, for instance, with calls, much deeper, um, you will have less cells. And at some point, oh, okay. uh, they, they, they look almost bleached, right? Um, mm. So there's, of course, this kind of trade-off where... Yes, you can upregulate and make use of the limited available light, but at some point, um, 
that that strategy might not um, might not work anymore as Slack becomes very. Mm. And may I ask a second little question? <laughs> yeah. Uh, did you um, find a difference between scler uh, like sclerotinian corals and soft corals? So um, we actually haven't worked very much with soft corals. Um, okay. But um, so um, they do they do have these spicules, right? Um, yeah, and, because yeah. of the spicules. Um, exactly, and, and they're made out of calcite, right? Yeah, it's, it's a, a silicium. Yeah. Yeah, and, yeah. and so. So, I mean, it might be possible that there is some, um, some light scattering in there as well. Uh, you know, I talked with a colleague many years ago about whether there could actually be some kind of really waveguiding or some loose waveguiding going on. It, it, there, there might be something like that, but um, it hasn't been shown yet. And I haven't looked into it in detail, but, you know, uh, it's the potential. So I, okay. I don't <laughs> Thank you so much. I was just my curiosity. Yeah. <laughs> Thank You're you. Welcome. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's no other questions yet. So maybe there's no, no more questions. So I would like to thank uh, Daniel for, uh, for, for uh, accepting uh, to, 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 to present uh, this talk. And, uh, and also I would like to thank uh, everyone that came to, to, to listen to the talk. And in fact, uh, we, with this, we arrived to the end of the Assemble conference that went on along for two weeks. Uh, and uh, uh, and I think it was a very good experience for us. At least, you know, of course, these things online are a bit different from the usual. So uh, we hope that uh, next year we'll organize another conference online uh, uh, because for us it's also important to see the results of, uh, of, the, of the transnational access and, and get some feedback. And so, as you can see, I think this has been a very uh, good talks uh, in general, uh, very good research. And so with this, I thank you everyone and uh, wish you all the best and hope to see you anywhere and anytime. Bye-bye. First Class Scientific Research relies on effective, convenient access to tools, facilities and data. Assemble Plus is a European Union funded research and innovation program with a consortium of over 20 partners that integrates key marine research facilities across Europe and beyond, offering access to top tier research infrastructure through a competitive application procedure, evaluated on the basis of a feasibility assessment and research excellence. Whether from academia, industry or policy, through its easy and straightforward application process, Assemble Plus provides scientists with on-site or remote access to biological resources, varied ecosystems, experimental facilities, technology platforms, e-infrastructure and expertise, and provides lodging and catering support over the course of their placement. Assemble Plus also performs its own networking and research activities, ranging from interacting with new users and businesses, to cryobanking marine organisms, to providing diving services for researchers. Over the course of the project, as well as providing access, Assemble Plus aims to strengthen transnational and multidisciplinary networks, create public-private partnerships, enable new technologies and services, upskill researchers, and improve the long-term sustainability of Europe's marine biological stations. So, if you are a researcher in need of access to marine infrastructure, such as laboratories, equipment, or any other provision, Assemble Plus welcomes proposals for access on a rolling basis from the 29th of August 2018 to the 30th of October 2020. For more information about the project and call for access, please visit www.assembleplus.eu.